Prince Mirin was a repeat of a round one pairing from the Moscow Speed Tournament, and Vichy found his opponent just as difficult to cope with as last time. While Ilya Smirin has not yet made it into the circuit of top rank Grandmaster tournaments, he is clearly a formidable prospect when it comes to speed chess. The first of their 25 minute games is a good example of his resourceful, practical style. The next game was drawn, so it all came down to the Blitz playoff. The rules for this were exactly the same as in Moscow. Players drew lots for colours, white gets 6 minutes and black 5, but if the game is drawn, then black goes through. Interesting scenario, the, the coin has been tossed and Smearin has the white pieces and amazingly enough, Danny, this is a repetition of what happened in Moscow. The players were even after the first two games and now again, Smearin has the white pieces as he did then, Anand the black pieces, but if Anand draws the game, he wins the match. That's right, but Smearin has a time advantage, has a one minute time advantage to compensate for that. So, it's all down to this game. Smirin opens with his favorite e4 move. And Anand playing symmetrically for the moment. Smirin lashing out with his pawn. So this is a typical opening that Anand uses. He's, he's used it in many big time competitions. He's won a lot of games with it. And now, just playing quickly, all he needs to do is draw and he'll move on to the next round. Kasparov awaits the winner. So that's a slight surprise. Anand thinking about this move. Slightly unusual. Now, what's he going to play? I've never seen Anand so uncertain. It's incredible. He's spending a lot of time on his clock, and you have to remember that he's spotting Smearin a minute, and for him to be thinking this deeply, and it's only like the fourth, the fourth move on the board. It's incredible. Smearin playing very cleverly here. Now, what's he going to do? Thinking. I think this is unbelievable. He's almost spent a minute, a minute, 20% of his time for four moves. It's incredible, the uncertainty of this strong player. He clearly is a bit off form. He better get back in form or he's going to be out of this competition. He's under four minutes now. It's crazy. Come he's... on. <laughs> Come on, Vichy. Make a move. Make a move. Madness. Come on. This is, this is unbelievable. This, this is shocking. I, I'm stunned to see it. He's thinking this long. On, on, on this, the fourth move of the chess game, analyzing what I do not know, but Smirin has successfully thrown him off, and now he's used a minute and 30 seconds to think about four moves. This is completely ridiculous. He's putting himself into a deep, deep hole. Yeah, I mean, this, this simple recapture of the pawn by White is a little bit unusual. Normally, you attack this knight first. Having said that, the position is fairly simple. What is Vichy doing? He's finally made a move. I mean, could it, could it have been that dramatic? I do not know what he was thinking about, but it's certainly surprising. He spent all that time and finally he's chased the knight. Although, although he's renowned to be an incredible speed player, we've seen him uncertain in this match. He, he needs to get his form back, and he's lost a lot of time in the clock, and he needs to start whipping out some moves. And finally, he's pushed his pawn up, and now he's beginning to play a little bit quicker. The bishop attacking, and now his knight has come out into the game, and now he's speeding up. The king is castled. So this is a fairly well-known position. Um, but Anand has used almost two minutes to get there. I, I still don't know what he was doing. So the, he's played this way before. This is a known theoretical position. So Anand knows it very well, but he's, he's moving... He's used a lot of time on his clock. He's used a lot of time, and, and now he's under three minutes, and Smirin has not even used one minute. He's not even used 60 seconds on his clock. Anand already used about two, and two minutes, 15 seconds. So the time could be a crucial factor here. Anand's position is fine, very solid, reasonable. He has great experience with this opening, but he's down on time. He's exchanging off pieces now. His knight has to drop back, and he's dropped back to the center. The knight kicking at this bishop. So let's, let's suppose he wants to save that bishop. Well, then he'll have to drop it back one square. He doesn't want to do that. He's left S it alone. Smirin increasing the pressure. Now, this knight is stopping this attack down towards the king, the queen bishop, in a very threatening battery down here. So the pawn has come up. He's taken, oh, this is fantastic. He's taking this pawn. He's sacrificing a piece. And now, 
Mirren has collected another pawn. It seems as if he thought he was going to win this knight, but Anand has defended it quite simply with this bishop move, and maybe Smearin is going to be down a piece. Okay, but Smearin has two pawns for this piece, and he's, he's now got a third. So he has three pawns for the piece. That's compensation itself. I can't help but think, though, that Anand up a piece is a lot more confident. He's starting to move like his old self. He's gotten the challenge, and he's going to try to meet it, moving much quicker, moving his king now up that dangerous, deadly diagonal. He's put it in the corner, hiding it, and he has a piece. But as you said, Danny, three pawns for it is what White has. Yeah, but I mean, I would still prefer, I would prefer White's position here, definitely. And at least Anand has something to go for now. It's fairly clear where his chances lie. So he's down on time, but he's got something to play for now. He's whipping off moves. There's suddenly a pause in the situation. Look at Smirin's bishops. Despite being a piece down, he has some healthy bishops sitting in the middle of the board, and he's attacking a pawn, and Anan has ignored it. This is why they call this a shootout. Both sides' guns come out blazing and now making sure that no attack happens and Anand has sacrificed the bishop in the middle but of course he would gain that queen and he sacrificed his his rook for the bishop and now he's attacking he's attacking a rook and a queen this is fantastic battle going on so here. the reason he's done that is to trade off pieces there you go he's just trading more pieces off the board and it seems he's about to win not just one pawn but two he's ripping a rook no, in fact, he's only going to win one pawn, and he's up a piece. And, Danny, this is like a quick turnaround, and Anand is just up a piece. Okay, he's up a piece. But uh, he's oh, taking a pawn. Fantastic. And he sacrificed his queen. If Unbelievable pawn. sacrifice. Anand showing his form. So, at the start of this, Smirin had three pawns for the piece. Now he's only got one. Vichy, Vichy has a clearly winning position here. Oh. The only problem is time. He has about a minute and a half to try and win this game. Smirin has over three minutes. And look at Anand display his skill, his accuracy, and his moves moving quickly, showing just why they consider him so fast and so rich a speed player. He's just moving quickly now. He's had a big disadvantage on the clock, but he's got an extra piece. But this, this is not over yet. This game is not over. Anand has only a minute and a half to try and win this game. Oh, but look at that position. The pieces, oh, and he thumped that rook down with authority, and bam, he's ripped off all the extra pawns. He's just got a pass pawn, and look at him make a minute look like a year. He's ripped another pawn off the board. The highlight of the first round was undoubtedly the clash between Nigel Short and Judith Polgar. Although Polgar is clearly the world's strongest woman player, Nigel was still the favorite for this match. In the first game, Judith opened with her customary pawn to e4, and Nigel played very solidly. He played the French defense. Polgar played pawn to d4, and Nigel played the pawn to d5. That's the French defense. Knight came out to c3, protecting pawn e4. And now, instead of the winner, bishop b4, which can lead to some very sharp positions indeed, Nigel played the classical, played his knight out to f6. Pawn came to e5, and the knight dropped back to d7. And now Judit played the slightly unusual move that was a favourite of Wilhelm Steinitz in the last century. She played knight back to e2. Nigel played his pawn to c5, attacking the pawn on d4, which Judit supported with c3. Knight came to c6, now f4. Nigel captured on d4, Udit recaptured. And now Nigel played a slightly unusual move. He played his pawn to f5, blocking up the kingside position. Interestingly enough, just before this tournament, I'd actually done a video on the French defence, and I'd recommended exactly this kind of defensive formation for black. What Black is trying to do is close the position on the king side and then attack on the queen side. Knight came out to f3 and the knight came to b6. It's preparing queen side offensive. 
and you played very aggressively right from the word go. Now, the most normal move seems to me to be knight c3 and then bishop to d3, just developing some pieces. But she didn't bother with that at all. She played h3, and after bishop e7, she played the pawn to g4, trying to open up lines on the king side. Now, this strategically, this is a good idea, but to do it so early on in the game is very risky, and Short took advantage of this straight away. He checked. And now Polgar is in deep trouble. She captured the bishop. That's possibly, possibly a mistake. Short recaptured with the queen. Check. And now the king had to go for a bit of a walk. Nigel played queen to f2. And just look at white's pieces. They can hardly move at all, and this king is running around in the middle of the board. This pawn on d4 is threatened. There's a knight here that threatens to come in c4 with check. The situation is desperate. Polgar felt forced to sacrifice pawn. She played the pawn to b3, and short captured on d4. Polgar continued meandering her king across the board. It's king c3. And now, I think short should have played his knight to f3, just keeping white's pieces completely clogged up. The most obvious move for white now seems to be knight to d4. But then, bishop d7 comes, really powerful move. The main idea of this is that after queen takes f3, rook c8 check, king b4, queen e1 check, king to a3, and now rook takes c1, gives black a winning attack. If instead knight takes f3, then rook c8 check again. If king b4, then queen c5 is mate. And if king to d3, then bishop b5 is also checkmate. Instead, short chose to capture the rook in the corner, which also looks completely winning. The king came back to b2 and short took the rook in the corner. Then knight takes d4. If we look at the position, black has an exchange and a pawn up, but the position is not quite as clear. White is threatening bishop to b5 check, winning the queen in the corner. So that's the immediate threat. So to get out of that, short checked with his queen. And then the king came back to b1. But now you can perhaps see that white's position is a little better coordinated than it was before. Short castled. It looks like a completely natural move. Then came a4, threatening to play a5. The knight must retreat to d7, and e6 hangs. So short played his pawn to a5. Rook came to a2. Now this was the real point behind moving the pawn up to a4. Suddenly the rook, which was bottled up in the corner, has given, been given some freedom. The queen came to g3, now rook g2. Attacking the queen, but also lining up against the king. And I think, at this moment, Polgar might actually be winning. The game has turned so quickly. Short played queen c3. Polgar captured on e, on f5, then e takes f5. So that's just opening up the g-file. Then bishop b2, queen c7, Polgar played e6. Now let's just have a look at this position. White has a superb attacking formation. The bishop on b2 and the rook on g2 are lined up against the pawn on g7. The knight on d4 stands excellently. The bishop on f1 is ready to come into the attack, as well as the queen on d1. Now, if we have a look at black's position, look at that bishop on c8. 
has no moves at all. It's locked in by the pawn on e6. The knight on b6, no moves whatsoever. Has no no move that's that's sensible. And if this knight and the bishop can't move, that means the rook in the corner is trapped. So in effect, short is playing without the rook, bishop, a knight, and that's going to prove fatal. Short attempted to block out the bishop on b2 with rook f6, but then came knight takes f5, a shocking move. If rook takes f5, probably a few ways to win, but the cleanest is queen to d4, a lovely move, very simple. The threat is rook takes g7 check, and there's no defense. If g6, then queen h8 is mate. Short played the rook to g6 to block the attack on the g-file. Then came bishop e5, attacking the queen. Queen d8. And now knight takes g7. Polgar was playing it very simply indeed. There were many other attractive continuations, but this is just very simple, just keeping the pieces, the bishop on c8 and the knight on b6, locked out of the game. Short played the pawn to d4. Now he's hoping to bring his knight on b6 back into the game via d5. But it's a vain hope. There came f5. Attacking the rook and supporting the pawn on e6. Rook takes g2. Bishop takes g2. And now queen to g5. Now again, a very simple continuation from Polgar. She's known for her great attacking prowess. But here, she chose simply to exchange queens. That forces queen takes h5 because of the threats down to e8 and f7. And this ending is completely winning for white. Once again, it's those pieces locked out on the queen side and of course the pawns here will be deadly. The rook came up to a6. It's still not going anywhere. Polgar calmly captured the pawn on d4. Short played knight a8. But after bishop d5, he was forced to resign. The threat is e7 check. And if king f8, then bishop c5 check, king e8, knight g7 check, king d8, e7 check, followed by e8 queen, and that's the end of the game. What a catastrophe for short, to have been presented with a winning position in the opening, only to throw it away so quickly, was humiliating for a player of his class. He was clearly demoralised for the second game and went down to a Polgar bristling with confidence. At the end, the crowd went crazy. Judith remained on stage for a few moments to receive the applause and an enormous bouquet of flowers presented by admiring fans. The crowd had high hopes for their local hero, Joel Ben. Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without uh, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you uh, in my videos. Thank you.